folks want to get started? Sure. Okay. I'll call the Town of Bristol Select Board meeting to order at 7 o'clock on July 25th, 2022. Review agenda for addition, removal, or adjustment of any items. Val? You muted, Val. Silly. Okay, I don't have anything to add, but just one thing to mention that uh, at a prior meeting, Joel did ask that uh, that an item be on tonight's agenda about voting, about um, reducing the uh, village speed limits to 25. Uh, that'll be on the next agenda instead, the August 8th. Okay. Yeah, I, re I remembered that after you sent out the agenda, that the right. one item that we missed that later, that day later, I was like, oh, it was that, right? Excellent. So nothing else? No. Okay. Thank you. Uh, two, overview of Zoom meeting operation and procedures, rules for participation. Folks, I think know by now. Uh, please mute your microphones and be recognized by myself, the chair, if you wish to speak. Item two, public forum. Five minutes for any item that is not on this evening's agenda. Hello, this is Brett LaRose. I have something. Hello, Brett LaRose. Please, five minutes is yours. Well, hopefully, 30 seconds, but um, hold on, I'll get my video on here. Uh, I just wanted to ask um, if the town is thinking about putting out their annual notice about trimming back shrubs, sidewalks, intersection. Very dangerous right now. Uh, one example is the intersection of North and Pleasant Street. Coming off that street, you literally have to just close your eyes and, and pray because you cannot see. So, and that, that happens every year at that intersection. But, uh, and also the sidewalks are getting pretty bad in some places. So, I'm curious if the town is going to be able to do anything about that. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Val? Uh, I will have to defer to uh, Sharon and Eric at the moment. Uh, we have not discussed it lately. I know it's kind of come up at previous meetings, so I don't know if, if they have come up with a plan. Okay. Sharon or Eric, do you have a plan for what Brett mentioned? Eric shaking his head no, not at this time. <laughs> okay, as is Sharon. Okay, thank you, Brett, for bringing that to our attention. A plan will be formulated and uh, bushes will be trimmed, I'm sure. On, on a related, uh, totally un, yet unrelated note, uh, just this past weekend, my husband and I, we walk reg regularly on Main Street in Waitsfield, and there's this one property where it just is the lilac bush is just overgrown with grapevines, and you really have to push your way through it to get through it, and it's really dangerous because people have to walk into the into the street to avoid it. Well, this weekend we we uh, took our took it into our own hands and with loppers and, and clippers and just cut the whole thing back, and it was just, it looks beautiful now and you can walk all the way through it and uh, anyways we just took matters into our own hands so i totally relate to it and <laughs> uh yeah something should be done are you suggesting bristol residents take matters into their own hands and trim? whatever it takes <laughs> <laughs> okay brett, it's good, it's brett good. i'm sure but i'm sure you have a chainsaw brett so well maybe we'll see you out there <laughs> hey, just be careful. that's recorded so i got that <laughs> <laughs> all right no so on the uh um, the, the real answer to that is that uh, yeah. Public Works Forum, Foreman uh, Eric Cota and Sharon will formulate a plan to have those trim backed where, where needed. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't see any other public forum, so moving on. Number three, item three, department head roundtable. Uh, let's start with Sharon from the clerk's office. Good evening. Uh, as you know, August 9th is the next election. That's two weeks away. We've gotten quite a few absentee ballots. Uh, there's been some issues with um, testing some of the equipment for the election. So hopefully they've got it figured out. We got new downloads today. So uh, I am still looking for people to help with the election, especially in the afternoon. Um, with checking people in and also staying to count that night after the polls close. So that's 
pretty much my focus right now for the next couple of weeks. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Sharon? Going back to the uh, that first item uh, to about the trimming, uh, the reason Sharon's involved is because uh, that plan uh, had often included a letter that would be sent out to property owners, uh, giving them uh, the opportunity to trim the, the shrubs themselves. And if they didn't by a certain date, then the, the Public Works Department would be coming along and, and doing it for them. So that's why Sharon's involved. Okay. Good Sharon, know. just for Valerie, um, Brett makes up a good point, though. I know, Eric, you guys always do that in October, just before the streets, we start plowing the sidewalks, mm -hmm. but most of the leaves are gone by then. And maybe they ought to have to take a good peek now at the intersections and and um, get them cut now instead of cutting the whole tree. No, but you you may not cut what you've got to cut now because all the leaves have fallen off it and you don't see a problem. But you can get hit by a, another vehicle pulling out of an intersection in the middle of August or July as good as you can in December or January. Oh, absolutely. But if you guys want to take the grief, we'll only cut them down. I'll be more than happy to No, 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 no. I didn't oh, say that. Yes, yes, yes. I didn't say that, Eric. I said, well, we sent out a letter and said, we've had some issues and we'd like to meet with you to cut some branches off your tree. That'll work if they want to do the letter first. Yep. So who's re really, truly responsible for cutting them? Trimming them. Is it the landowner or is it the town? Well, if it's our intersection, I think it's it behooves us to. If the only landowner won't do it, then yeah, if it's then, within the right of way. Then, then uh, the, town say, has, the town has the authority to do it. But we try to give the property owners a, a chance to do it themselves the way they want it done, and if they don't do it, then it's fair game. And we also make announcements on Front Porch Forum as well, right? That's a good I, idea. I, I, I've seen those previously where it was announced to, to trim stuff back, I'm sure. That's usually in October, though, before snow yeah, flies. So, yeah, yeah is it, is it, it seems like now would be the, a good opportunity if we are, could announce it on Front Porch Forum. And then if we have uh, locations that we know about, maybe a letter could be sent and then things could be trimmed. I think it's offering the, the, property owner the ability to trim before uh, the town does it, I think it would, would, is always a good good way of handling it, I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's do uh, Meredith, Recreation Department. All right, very cool. Um, so we've been busy. We've had camps all summer. Uh, right now we're doing a mountain bike camp. We've got 15 riders um, and we've got a few uh, past riders that we have become uh, CITs or assistant counselors. So that's very cool. Um, and it's going strong. We also have clay camp that started this week and that's a big plus. A uh, couple of fun things. August 2nd is the Very Merry Theater Group. That's going to be playing on the town green. That's a free event. That's great. Um, that'll start at six and there's a rain or a rain location of the Holly Hall and then um, August 18th is Clifford the Big Red Dog. That's the movie in the park. Um, we reached out to Winnie's Canine Legacy. Hopefully maybe they'll have a few dogs for adoption that they can bring and, and showcase um, and we'll have the scouts there as well selling some baked goods. Um, we have been using a transportation line. We've used the van from the parent child place in Middlebury. They're great, it's $25 a day to use the van. That's extremely inexpensive. And then for the mountain bike camps, because I have more than uh, 13 kids, we've been renting the bus from Betcha and that's been great. Um, and then uh, we've had an interview for the hub, hub uh, rec, coordinator and we have three more interviews next week so I'll definitely keep you guys posted on that it's very exciting we've had some really great candidates come through and we're excited to interview them um, and then following up we've got a music event on the Bre uh, Bristol Rec Pavilion and that's this Sunday from four to six so lots of things happening in the rec world fantastic any questions from Meredith from the board or anyone else All right, and I see you've been receiving some high praise from the public for your work, Meredith. Yeah, it's been great. It was great, great, great to read that. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let's do Brett, our department. 
Uh, yeah, no significant updates for the select board this evening. Um, yeah, I just, I guess one thing that's noteworthy is uh, continue to work with uh, Don Lathrop, uh, the Greenwood Cemetery and keeping uh, the water tank full. Um, Don actually thought today in an email when he was asking the fire department to, to, to fill the tank that maybe there's, maybe somebody is intentionally leaving the valve open on the water tank because it's how quickly it is emptying and, and you know, based on its experience, doesn't feel like you know, the water tank would empty as quickly as it's em being emptied to water flowers. Um, but uh, one of the updates he uh, he made in an email to me was that uh, Reg Dearborn, apparently he changed out the valve on the water tank. So it's now a spring loaded valve. So somebody can't just open the valve and leave it open. So now you'll have to work a little bit harder to get creative to leave it open, I guess. So, um, but as I said to Don in a previous email, you know, the, the fire department, uh, you know, continues to be supportive of this. It's, it's not a burden. I, I usually have people you know, multiple people raising their hands to, to help out with this task. So, but just a, an update on that front. Excellent. Thank you. Any questions for Brett? All right. Thank you. Uh, Eric, Public Works Department. Uh, not really too much, just uh, getting getting the equipment back in order. We got one truck repair, the more fixed, and now we got another truck down with air tanks that are leaking. Uh, so can't find the air tanks. They're back ordered. Don't know when they're going to be in. Hopefully they'll be here before winter. Uh, just uh, uh, appreciate the the public being um, um, what is it the word. Considerate. Considerate of how, how things are going with us, being that we've got new people and we're not getting around as quick on certain stuff as we normally do. So I just appreciate the people being understanding about that. Uh, that that's about it. Okay. We're still going to that mowing, right? Yeah, we've got the more fixed now so we can start back out again. And did Eric, you say in the, the bus trip, the road trip, that the, you're running the, the guide rail more over the rail more coming in August? August 8th, it'll be here, yeah, for two weeks. Good. Okay. Excellent. Any questions for Eric? Okay. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, let's do the water department. Jill. Hey there. How's everybody? Fantastic. On a beach, <laughs> looking nice there. Aha. Just trying to not show everybody my office. <laughs> um. I don't know that I have so much to discuss besides when we get to the item in the agenda. So I'd like to just save the time for that because that's about the biggest thing I can think of right now. Okay. Thank can you. Do. All right. Person, Ian Bruce is here. Oh, yes. Yeah. Where is he in person? He's in person. Fantastic. And finally, Bruce, police department. Anthony's here too. <laughs> I wasn't going to let you decide. Yeah, I'm here too. I'm here. Here. There he is. <laughs> I don't speak very loud, so I'll come up a little closer. Um, I don't usually uh, have much to bring, um, mainly because um, I'm the type of person that's taught that uh, you just go out and do your job. So I'm not comfortable uh, providing much information because I feel like I'm bragging. But anyhow, <clears throat> so Francis Smith, our police officer, graduated the Level three Academy on July 15th. Yay! So that's great that we have him back. Mm -hmm. So uh, I won't have to work as many overtime hours. Um, Yay! <laughs> yes. <laughs> if, you, um, if you call the police department now, we have a auto attendant to answer the call. Um, that is to alleviate unnecessary calls to the dispatch. So when if we're in the station, we'll answer the phone. If not, it'll go to the auto attendant. There's only three options. Leave a voicemail, voicemail for me, a voicemail for anybody else, and contact dispatch. But we ask that you not contact dispatch unless you really need to speak to somebody. And if you have an emergency, you should be down 911 and not our police number. Um, so on the 20th at the 
town park when the Masons had their community barbecue. We had Officer Matt Cohen and Canine Duke, a comfort dog, with the Williston Police Department. They were there. Um, it was a great um, program. This one, you could go up and pet the dog, not like some of the other demonstrations we've had before. Um, so, some stats for us. From January to June of this year, we're still learning our new database program, so we might be off by a few, but this is fairly accurate. We've either initiated or we're getting close to 1,930 incidents. Um, of those, 253 were either tickets or warnings, uh, and we had 12 criminal arrests. We continue to monitor parking issues on Lincoln Road. Since we've been doing that diligently for the last three years, we are issuing fewer parking tickets and we're having fewer complaints, but they're still, it needs attention. Um, some of the things that you might not see or hear that we do, we are out and about on foot. We might stop to talk to somebody in the park or somebody's looking for directions or we'll spend some time talking with the kids and handing out stickers. Um, we return to check on people that we've dealt with that were in crisis. Sometimes it's once a week, it could be twice a month or more. It depends on uh, what their crisis was. And that includes those that uh, threatened to harm us when we were there the first time we met them. So we continue to work with people, trying to assist them in getting the assistance or whatever needs that we can help them with. We continue to follow up with our community partners like Women's Safe, Hope, CSAC, Five Town Partners, Turning Point, and AgeWell. Um, those organizations are very helpful with uh, people that are in need. Um, we continue to hear feedback regarding our speed radar signs. Uh, they are great at slowing people down. They're actually slowing to read the sign to see what the message is. We try to change that every couple of weeks and we are looking for more ideas. So if you have some ideas for messages, please let us know. That's about all I have. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Bruce. Any questions for Bruce? Just would like to say, um, I noticed in the article of Queen Bees last week in Yadison that you guys got a little, you and her are working with the stickers for the little kids and you see something good. I think that's a great program. Thank you for that. Do they give the dogs out to all the little kids? No. No. <laughs> I was going to say, that's awesome. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Bruce. Thank you. And finally, Anthony, Treasurer's Office. You guys hear me? Yep. Yep. All right. So uh, probably the biggest thing going on in my office is we just finished the audit. Um, Valerie and I are waiting for the management letter to finish signing all of the documents, but that year's done. We can all be thankful that it's over and I meet with the auditors August 8th for the pre audit for this coming year. Uh, <laughs> so, just that. Um, and other news, we're just continuing to restructure our grants. I met with the auditor. And we have a better system for organization uh, for our bonds and loans payable. So that's pretty exciting. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any other major uh, transitions. But I, I think that's the biggest, the biggest uh, focus is right now. Well, the other major transition, Anthony, was you are now a Bristol resident. Oh, yeah, that get, as a personal matter, yeah, we've officially moved <laughs> to Bristol. Um, it's a big deal. So yeah, I mean we're excited. Hi. Oh. Does that mean you're walking to work, Anthony? I, I yes, uh, it's a ten minute Hi, walk if I if I go slowly. Um, so it it's it's nice. It's good to be close finally and not drive an hour one way. Yeah. Well, congrats. Yeah. Well, thanks. That's great news. All right. Thank you very much. Any questions for Anthony? All right. Thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate it. Let's move on to regular business. 
Number one, consider a request by a recreation department for installation of a bicycle repair station on Main Street Corner. All right, um, that, I think Valerie sent you guys pictures, but I did bring down the majority of the bike maintenance stand in the corner there um, in the meeting room. So you'll see it there. Yeah, yeah it's here. Yeah, yep. so that's, that's it in real life. That's what it looks like, that's how tall it is. Um, so Jerry and I met the other day on, um, we had discussed about a bike stand, but what was cool was Todd Warnock had given the rec department a bike stand two years ago. Um, and I just held on to it because just the timing just didn't really work out. And so now we'd like to move forward with it. Um, Jerry and I walked around, we walked around with this bike stand to the corners and tried to figure out where it would look pleasant and where it would not be in the way. And also um, we came up with the, the fact that it should be removed um, at the end of bike season. So the uh, public works department wouldn't actually move around it. Um, and then uh, we would we'd be taking it off and then putting a plate over it so it wouldn't get um, damaged. I think in the pictures there, I sent Valerie, there's a picture of the electric panel that's in the sidewalk as well. And sorry, this is east and north. This is right by the um, Walgreens sign. That's the best location that we came up with. It's out of the way. Um, it, it's actually a great spot visually as people ride down into town that way. Um, so the pictures just kind of give you an idea of where it would be located um, and we would be setting bolts in to the and then and then placing the the bike if, stand on there. If someone can make me a, a co-host, I can share those pictures. I already did, I thought Val. Oh. They were shared here. on screen. Uh, let me uh, I'll let me share them. They're not there doesn't come up on the Zoom. It might be oh. it might be just open up the PDF or something on the uh, computer. Ah. So see. if you've already seen them, never mind. Yeah, folks are familiar. Well, just for our, our audience here. All right, let me see here. Do, do, do. Uh, okay. There you go. So Meredith, while he's looking for that, quick question. The, it's gonna be bolted into the sidewalk and that then you're gonna winter you're gonna take unbolt it take it out and then cover up the bowls yeah so and, and jerry might be able to help me on this what you see is there's um it's a a bolt system and it's either uh you know we place the bolts in there and then we put the nuts we put the the stand on and then we uh put the nuts on and keep it that way yep. Well, what we can do is they like a lag bolt, you'd be a three quarter inch drill into the ground to be four of them. And then the lag bolts with the washer would screw into it and hold the whole stand up. And then when the stand was removed, we would just screw the bolts back in. So just the heads would be above ground. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, you can see in this picture that the figure one right next to it is the electrical panel that's in the in the cement that's over there. So the, the plate that we would put over those bolts is about that size, not the, not the width, but the, um, the height of that box that's covering the, the electrical panel. So would that cover the uh, bolts that are left? Is that what you're saying? You'll cover, you'll, you'll put a cover over the bolts. Yeah. Cause Jerry said, Jerry said, once you take it out, you put the bolts back in. So the bolt heads will be the heads will be sticking up. Okay, so will yeah, that just the four heads? So will that panel that you're talking about cover that? There would be a panel that we would create. Probably it's it's probably gonna be um you know like a pressure treated piece of wood that could go over that and maybe I paint it gray or whatever to match or oh, just a, a piece of metal, one eighth inch brown metal we could even make have somebody cut it and um cut the drill the holes and just use it as a cover plate so it won't mess up the uh, the sidewalk plow taken off the tops of the right. So, so the couple things, um, the, the electrical or 
whatever that box is that's in the ground used to be flush. The ground is shifted, so it's no longer flush. And so I, I worry that that's eventually going to be hit. I know that's another, another matter to this, but I, I do have concerns about a few things, one being stuff raised above the ground in terms of plowing. And I know that plowing isn't scraping right down, depending on what time it is during the season, but I do worry about something hitting. Um, more, more importantly, though, I, I personally don't feel this is the right location for this particular unit. Um, I don't think it really has any uh sort of connection with any bicycling that or or bike racks that are that are in the town i know that there aren't a lot on main street there are more on the park and i just feel it's kind of by itself looking at these photos and this one here um it seems kind of like a, an odd location just because it's out in the middle of nowhere there's nothing connecting it with with bicycle uh placement you know of the bike racks and I, I think it sort of looks strange with the signs, like the no parking sign um, and the lamp posts and things like that, especially because it's not the same color as the rest of our, our infrastructure here. So that's, that's one issue that I have, and it's, that's the biggest issue is the placement. The other issue is that there's no sun protection. So if you're working on your bike, you're out in the hot sun, um, there, there's no protection at, at any time from any angle, which I don't know if, if people would mind that or would that would be an issue for them and i also feel that it's a very public open spot and i worry about people just because it's out in the middle of the of the uh sidewalk that people wouldn't use it because they feel like they want to work on their bike maybe in a little in a, in a more sh shadowed or, or shaded spot um Those are have, have you considered across from recycled reading there's a bike rack there and it is a shady spot we did. We actually were over there. Um, we set it up a couple of times. Um, it, it felt a little cramped over there, uh, but there, you're right. There is a bike rack over there. Uh, but I mean, then we, we looked across the street, and it was like th that sidewalk area is more like a, you know, it extends out further than the normal walkway. Um, the bike rack issue that I bring up can be changed because the bike racks are all portable. The ones that Bristol Core got with their grant from the Realtors Association, they're just small gray ones, so they can be moved around. So, and there is one over by covers and it sort of gets shifted when the uh, grass gets mown. Um, when I looked and I went and looked at this and just to see the sort of the placement and, th and thought about it. And I agree, I think over at Recycled Reading, that area, we, we still haven't determined what we're gonna do with that area. Are there gonna be plantings there? Is it gonna be changed to something else? But it, it is a tight spot, I agree. Um, my thought would be to perhaps look at a placement over by the bike racks that have been a more permanent uh, installation over on the park. And I know we have a, a park ordinance uh, with regard to putting things on the park. Um, but that primarily is concerned with uh, permanent installations. Since this is a temporary installation in terms of a, a short period of time in, in the nicer months, I feel that that gives, us, gives you a little bit of leeway. Um, it also offers an area where the large majority of bikers that are coming in uh, know that spot already. You know, We often see them on a Tuesday or a Thursday, whenever that time is during the summer and during the spring months. So they're already familiar with that spot. Um, and it allows shade as well and a, and a more private area to be able to work on your bike. And I don't know if you've considered that or, or maybe didn't consider that because of the of the, the policy about putting things on the park. Yeah, and that's one of the, I, I had mentioned that to Jerry. I was like, I don't think we can put it on the park. I think everything's kind of been, you know, set in stone from what's in the park. But if you were allowing us to explore that possibility, um, Jerry and I would be glad to look at that and come back to you with a location that would be phenomenal i i looked at the you know a couple of days ago i looked through the policy and you know it's a measurement of everything that's on the park and the main things were if, if you want to put a new tree on you need to remove a tree things like that um because this this wouldn't be year round because you're able to easily sort of remove it and only have a, a small bit of infrastructure left in the ground 
uh, at ground level, it seems to me that it, it, it would be a viable candidate to use on the park, especially because you could really tie it in with a, an already determined and set up bike location. Um, you'd have to sort of figure out how you'd want to mount it because it's probably going to be grass. You're not going to be able to mount it in the sidewalk. Um, but if you and Jerry can sort of look at that and come back, I personally would be interested in that. I'm not sure uh, what the other board members think. Um, Ian, can, yeah. can we, would it be possible, because you got to anchor it to something, would it be possible to put a square slab of concrete there in the grass by the bike? Um, we'd have, we'd, I'll, I'll open, let's open it up to uh, Michelle and Joel and just get their thoughts. Well, first of all, um, if we make everybody else downtown go through the design review board, if that's going to be a thing there, I mean, some of the residents on Main Street down below the bar on the opposite side of the road couldn't even change a window before they went to the design review. I think that's got to go in front of the design review board, number one. But what about up in the back side of the park where the sidewalk runs, the North Street sidewalk in that first parking spot in the pavement? Just a thought. Just, where, just where? Off, is it near? Sorry, dear. Just as you, you're talking about, just as you turn into Park Street, right? Yeah, there's, a no, on, there's a spot that there's no parking. There's a spot there on the pavement. There's no parking. The first parking spot there's no parking. Well, or, near, the, just, near, the play, near the playground, Joel? No, on the, the other end. Way at the oh, the other end. If it was a cement pad right there at the end of the pavement, away from the sidewalk, maybe 10 feet off the sidewalk, right there so they're not, they're not going to see it there they're not because people are looking to the park and the traffic light that was one reason why we thought the spot that we chose because no matter where they park their bikes in the parking in the park they're going to walk by that traffic light to go to main street to the bakery which any of the you know people do that's where they if they do end up in the park with their bikes they're going to walk by the spot but if you don't have it where they're going to see it you know, like Cannon Park or right there or where they the rack is, they're just not going to use it. It's going to be we're going to spend all that time putting it up and the bikers aren't going to use it. It's got to be move visible. The rack back there? Yeah. Michelle asked, can we move the bike rack back, back up there? into that corner? And then people are going to come further toward the park and lean them against trees and stuff. You know, you know a like lot of people, a lot of people just go to the bakery and lean it against the windows, you know or the street lights and stuff right. even and and that you know that type of thing you suggested we should put the bike repair thing down in front of the bakery then <laughs> <laughs> no It'd be nice if we had more space but no that would be the ideal spot you know um it, you got to think about being visible uh, vi visual that's the main thing if they're not going to use them unless they see it um it's a tough call but i think yeah. The bike rack would be great in the park in the shade because everybody sees the bike racks because bikers are going to look at it if, in case. I think the first step is to find if we can put concrete in the grass, put a slab of concrete and then bolt it. That way it won't even affect anybody shoveling or plowing when we remove it, leave the bolt heads. Um, so if you, you put know, it up in the corner where you're talking about and you put the bike rack up there. So looking, looking at our zoning. Looking at our zoning regulations, the Design Review Commission, it doesn't seem like it would need to go before it. Uh, the main issues that that uh, committee looks at is the construction of buildings, outbuildings, fences, or retaining walls, uh, addition or alteration to the exterior of a building, um, and any change to an exterior wall or roof line, uh, and the materials used, so or the demolition of a structure. So it doesn't seem to fit. We can double check with uh, zoning admin Chris Perley on that. But it doesn't seem like this thing would have to go before the design review commission. I think what you mentioned, Joel, was probably something to do with the facade of a house, and so that's why. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah. I so it, yeah, I don't. I don't think it would need to do that. But we could obviously check with Chris. Yeah. Um, and I guess if if board members were supportive of the park, we would have to figure out if we felt it was okay to put in a small area of concrete in a in a determined area, <laughs> and whether that can be left there, and whether you know we want it low if we were allowed to do it, or if we allow people to do it, to be able to be mowed and things like that. Yeah, you probably only need to be about two feet square because it's not, they're not torquing, they're putting a bike on hanging it, but it's not like they're moving and swinging it. You know, if they Is sink there... it and they could, they could even sink studs into it. So you use nuts and that would be more solid 
than to use a lag boat because that can loosen up okay. that type of thing. What are your thoughts, Michelle? I don't know. I, I was trying to figure out why that North, North Street and Park wouldn't work if you put a bike rack there. Because if they go on the bike on the park, they're going to look for the rack, and the rack's there, then the, they're going to see the... I mean, I know right where you're talking, Jerry. It's right by the tree. It's about halfway up from the cannon. I see, always see when you were giving tours with VBT, they were always parked there. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking another 50 feet to the north along the side. Yeah, yeah. And, and, or put it the cement pad. You're not out a lot of money yeah. for a lot of time. If you put a two-foot cement pad at the end of the bike yeah. rack where it yeah. is now. Well, you can always that try it. it, see how it works. If it doesn't work, you can move it, you know. Right. That's a good point. I, wor I worry about with the parking spot is that you're starting to get a little bit close to the road then and cars turning in. And so maybe in terms of someone feeling safe, sort of putting a bike up and standing there and working there. And I know that there will there's some distance, but you are closer to to cars moving in than you would be over, say, where the bike racks are. Um, but I'd be, I'd be willing to sort of have Meredith and Jerry, you know, go and take a look, take some photographs and, and just like you did before, Meredith, uh, set the unit where it, where you think it might work best and then come back to us and see you know what it what it might look like and what the dimensions are from the sidewalk things like that i'm just worried about taking up that i mean you got a two by two cement just taking up more space on the park for people to sit and whatever i mean i, I know it's not a lot but it's, you keep putting things in there and... i mean i'm not opposed to the two by two if it's right next like this is almost touching the rack at the end of the rack okay yeah, that's, can do. that's easy right. yeah or do they go back in the same place? Because if we pick them up in the winter time, um, Eric said they don't go in storage. They you, stay don't there. you pick them up anywhere? The ones on the park, they stay. I don't pick them up unless okay. somebody else does. Okay. I thought they were. Yeah, they up. they get they get moved around with the mowing and stuff like that. But I mean, I think you could determine an area, Val. And you're muted. Wherever it gets located, if it gets located, uh, will there be a sign to help inform people what it is? Because some people might not recognize it and scratch their head. What the heck is this for? Is it a sculpture? So, uh, <laughs> so just a thought. Yeah, I totally agree. Because the there's only a little kind of bike with a wrench as wheels on it that you'll see in the corner. And that, that doesn't give enough explanation. I mean, most riders will know exactly what that is. But for new folks or just casual riders um, who need to just put air in their tires or what have you, they would probably we can easily put a, a a sign on front of it and kind of just you know a couple of the wording would be you know thank you to the select board for letting us put this here or you know uh, maybe somebody that supports us um, sponsors the cement or whatever. Um, but also to be like, hey, this town is bike friendly. This is this is for the community to use. What's the so I remember getting that because I talked to Todd and he was like, this is in my garage. Can I give it to you? And I said, sure. Uh, so I'm I'm excited to see this going in. What's actually on the unit? What can you do with the unit? Uh, everything. It comes with a set of tools too. So for one, it has um, an air. Um, it's heavy. So it has an air pump, um, so you blow up your tires, and then it has uh, a wrench, Allen keys, uh, pliers, um, tire sure irons, there. Okay. tire irons. Yep, to change a yep. tire. Oh. Yep. Screwdriver. Okay. So it has everything you need to do minor repairs on your bike. Okay. And the bike right. just hangs. You just put your saddle up on the top crossbar, so it just hangs by the saddle. So it's real simple. Uh, the whole front of it's open, so you can see the tools by cable. There's one up by Wealthy Living. There's different ones around. Okay. You know, this one's nice because it's bright red. A lot of them are silver. Right. So this one's bright red. Okay. Val. But the pump's a nice thing. A lot of okay. people, you know, that's a nice thing about it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not muted this time. Yeah. Um, it's got it's got a QR code, so you can actually scan it, and it gives you directions. Oh, good. <laughs> I'll I'll need that. I'm sure. <laughs> All right, Val. Just a question a about clinic. security and what's going to prevent the second person who uses it to walk off with all those tools. They're all I mean, attached. Yeah, they're cables. all attached. Okay. You'd have to, 
you'd have, I mean, you could take a cable snap and cut it pretty quick, but I, I really feel good about people not doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. Okay. Yeah. Um, so is the board okay with Meredith and Jerry uh, doing a new site recce and coming back with a proposal? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. You're okay with that, Meredith and Jerry? Yep. Yeah, we're, we're good with that. Okay. And you can, if you uh, shoot me an email, I'm happy to come out to and, and work with you guys on that if you'd like me to. Yeah, that'd be great, actually. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, let me know. All right. So to be continued, I think. Great. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Meredith. Thank you, Jerry. All right. Let's move on. Uh, 740. Write that down. There we go. Item two, consider adding two VFDs, variable frequency drives, to the new generator for high lift pumps at Pump House. May include deliberation in executive session to discuss contract negotiations. Val and Jill. Yes, this is on the agenda because it's time sensitive for the, related to the new generator that was installed at the pump house. Uh, this topic is above my head, so hopefully Jill and Jim can help explain what the situation is and what the potential next steps are. Hello, Jill, and hello, Jim. And Jim is muted. Yep. All right. All right. All right. Who would Maybe. like to who would like to start? Um, I guess I'll start. Um, uh, as uh, Valerie outlined uh, in her uh, email that she sent out over the weekend, um, the new generator has been installed. Um, it has a what is standard for the industry, a 0.8 power factor. And the one that was there, uh, the Generac was a 0.5 power factor. And what that simply means is the motor starting capability of the generator. 0.5 is extremely unusual. When I spoke to the Kohler engineer, um, he thought I was hitting him when I told him that was there was a 0.5 and asked me to send the tag over there. Um, 0.8 is the industry standard. So back in probably in the mid nineties, when that was installed, that was a specially custom, uh, generator that was installed. So the issue is the pump station has two seventy five horsepower pumps in there that, uh, require a larger capability of starting power than what a standard 125 kW generator is. And that's what you had there before 125 kW generator, but with a PF factor of 0.5. So we conferred with Pioneer Motors to uh, who we've used from time to time to address motors. And what they suggested as did the Kohler engineer uh, was to install a VFD drive for uh, for a pump and for the one of the 75 horsepower pumps. Um, we uh, passed on the pricing of that to Valerie, um, I think the end of last weekend and, and a further document today. So there's a VFD drive and then a reactor drive that cleans the harmonics of the generator. Um, so that it can uh, appropriately work. Um, we know that you know the the specs that was provided by the town re uh, requested a 0.8, which is standard. So probably no one noticed it at the time or really looked closer at the unit that you did have there at the time. Nobody on a standard basis makes a 0.5. Um, Polo doesn't make them at all. Um, and so, you know, we do other projects with the town of Bristol and we want to be a good partner. So we said to Val, uh, we have a, one of our towable rental generators there right now so that if you lost power, the pumps could work and we have tested them. 
Uh, so we said to Valerie, we would provide that for no charge and uh, our master electricians would install the VFDs at no charge. Um, and we just asked for the VFD and the, react the reactor tool uh, be picked up by uh, the town. Um, and, uh, you know, this way nobody's got, you know, too much of a financial burden to uh, cure this. Sure this issue. Okay. I think I'm so, ready to give you a little bit of feedback as well. Okay. Um, so go on. Say, what was that again, Jill? Sorry. I did do a little bit of more research today about okay. that 0. 0.5 power factor. The Generac generator that was originally there, if you look at the tag, is a 250 kVA times 0.5 power, power factor to make it a 125 kilowatt. What we have now installed is a 160 kVA at a 0.8 power, power factor, making it 128 kilowatt. What I learned today is it means that it does not, this Kohler does not have the oversized alternator of our original generator. So there's not as much copper there for the startup. That is correct, um, but the spec that was provided by the town called for a 125 kW generator with a 0.8 power factor. And that's what we provided. We provided the uh, submittals with our bid that I assume somebody reviewed to approve it. Um, and to the best of my knowledge, uh, Kohler had provided the uh, same generator to several other contractors who expressed an interest. I'm not sure they all submitted something, um, but the bottom line is the spec called for a 125.8 kW. It did. What was missed by everyone was three quarters of the way down the first page on the bill of material. It says generator oversized to meet motor starting requirements. So that was that missed is, by everyone. That, that is true, um, and it called for a 200 starting power. And if you review the spec sheet on page two that was provided at the time of submittal, the starting KVA for that generator, the Kohler, is 520. The pump requires probably close to 700 KVA. So therein lies the problem. <clears throat> Okay, um, so there's the suggestion of the, the VFDs, is that the only way forward apart from getting a whole new generator? You, you can't rebuild or, or change parts of the generator to, to match what we need for our system? Um, well, I asked Kohler if they even made a 0.5 and they do not. Um, I've actually gone on the web looking for 0.5 power factor generators and could not find any. I also conferred with an electrical engineer that does a lot of work with us at uh, hospitals, et cetera, and asked him about a 0.5 power factor. He also was not aware of one, has never um, engineered one. He has over 40 years as an electrical engineer. <laughs> When this was done back in the mid nineties, some very smart person did something that um, was very unique and it, it worked. Um, if we had to get a larger generator, the pricing would probably have close to tripled. You would respectfully need a 250 kW generator. So instead of just swapping out the old the old Generac, you would have to tear everything out, including the pad. You'd have a bigger footprint, more electrical. You, I think the whole job was, uh, you know, under 50 grand, this type of a job would, would exceed six figures. So this is a, probably the best approach to address um, this particular issue. 
Um, I think there was an engineer involved. I don't know if he has any different suggestions, but um, that's that's uh, from us uh, talking to our engineers and talking to Pioneer, that would be their recommendation. Okay, and what's the reason for two VFDs versus a single VFD? I'm not sure you need two F VFDs. Uh, and the reason is even the former Generac generator could not run those two pumps, the two larger pumps, they're 75 horsepower, could not run them simultaneously. So if you wanted the ability to run both of them, um, that generator would be just about at its max um, to, to uh, run both. It could be done as long as the other loads in the building are, are minimal, um, but theoretically it could be done, uh, but it could not be accomplished with your old system uh, before. Uh, so uh, the question was asked, if we wanted to run both pumps, could it be done? Theoretically, yes, um, but it would take that generator to the max and we'd have to look at potentially having some load shedding devices if the generator was meet, meeting maximum output. Okay. That's not, that's not why. Um, it's because we have two pumps and they alternate. So if it was the turn for pump one to run and it had an alter and it had the VFD and we were in standby power, it would start up. If we were in pump two when the power went out and it had a VFD, pump two would be able to run. This generator cannot run our pumps. It cannot start them and it cannot run them. So Jill, it's my understanding and you can correct me if I'm wrong. When that pump station loses power, neither pump comes on automatically. The generator does, but the pumps require a technician to go in there to uh, shut down the alarms and then reset the controls. So Assuming that that is still the case, unless something has changed or is different than my understanding, a human being could start the correct pump. That said, uh, if that's not the case and it does happen automatically, uh, at least our experience being there at the pump station testing things, there was always a reset that had to be done manually we could use a load shedding device and control that when the generator comes on, only the pump with the VFD comes on. So do we need one VFD or two? Depends I would on, say- Depends I on what would, direction. I, I, I mean, it, it, it would be nice to have both, I guess. Um, recognizing that um, in the past, when you had the previous generator, only one of those 75 horsepower uh, pumps could run at, at under generator power. They could run on utility power, possibly. Um, I'd have, I don't know what the size of that transformer is on the pole, but um, it's, it, it, to me, it would be a nice to have, not a necessarily a need to have. Are you, Jill, are you comfortable with that? I mean, it seems like the VFD is for the generator to, to run either pump. And Jim's saying that we can't run, I mean, we the gen, new generator can't run both pumps at once, but we would never run both pumps at once if they're alternating, correct? We would not run both pumps at once because the flow is too great for our system as well. We have them for redundancy so that we can pump water <clears throat> up to the tank and have redundancy. So if okay. one pump dies, we have the other pump to use. Okay. And so really for this, I mean, our what we're trying to do, this is our backup to be able to run a pump, a single pump. So it seems like the generator with just a single VFD would do the trick. And it and the the main thing would be that the generator and the single VFD can handle either of the pumps, depending on which one ran at at a time, right? I don't no. think so. I mean, Can I, I step could be in here for a minute. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure the VFD is is in line with a particular pump. I don't think it can alternate between pumps. Oh, I see. Sorry, that is correct. That is correct. So you always have 
whenever that water pump station is running, you have a 75 horsepower pump running and you have the low lift pump running as well. So there is always two pumps running. Yeah. Always. But not That's too high lifts. Not too high, not two 75s, but you have a 75 and a 15. The okay. low lift takes out of the splitter box to feed the high lift pump, which then pumps to <clears throat> the tank. What I know is that when those technicians came in, nobody checked any voltage and nobody looked at any tags. Because if you would have looked at the tags, you would have known what you had. Okay. I stood there and I watched the salesman come and look at it. Nobody verified voltage. Nobody looked at the actual tags. We had to take pictures of tags to give them to you. Now, I want to know where in your responsibility of selling a generator to a town, does it come in that, hey, this is too small and it should have been caught before it got to this point? So let me address that. I think that starts with the engineer that was involved that provided the town the specs. If we engineer a, pro a project from the very beginning, knowing that we're going to get the job per se, if it's a private clientele versus a a bid spec job. As I mentioned earlier, we have an engineer um, that provides, we do power studies where we actually hook up a machine that measures the power, um, not only just the kilowatt hours, but the peaks. But that's not the situation. When you have a bid spec and you have an engineer who's determining what that is, the belief by all the folks that have bid, and I believe there were more than just Brookfield Service that bid this, we all collectively followed the spec that was provided to us. So um, the engineering cost is something that the town might need to deal with. That's a separate matter from us. Um, of course, we have somebody come and look to see what is going to be needed to move the, the unit in and out. But we look at the specs to believe them to be accurate. Um, Val, so where do the where do those original specs come from? I believe they came. Well, Jill can verify this, but I believe they came with the original generator. Yep, it's the bill of material from the original generator, and the, the mid nineties, mid to late nineties. But the RFQ ask score is the equal to what is installed at the pump house, and this bill of material and what's installed at the pump house. They're not apples to apples. They're not apples to apples. So right. herein lies our issue. We have a generator that doesn't have enough kick to start our high lift pump. So I think we have an option to <clears throat> put in a VFD so that one of the pumps can run, one of the high lift pumps can run. I don't under I don't know if that means that some type of programming needs to be in the VFD to say only this one pick this one this time because we're on standby power. I'm not really sure how that programming works. Um, there was not engineering for this RFQ. This was just an equal for equal replace what we have so it can do what we have. Okay, mm -hmm. but, it, but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't manufactured as equal to equal. That, right. that got lost along the way. And it seems like Jim is, is maybe putting that on the town in terms of we, it wasn't engineered, but I feel that if it was if it was asked to be equal and it's not equal, that that's doesn't seem like it's equal. Well, you have to go by what your specs say, which calls for 125.8 power factor. I believe, and Valerie, you can comment to this, that everybody provided you with the same type of generator. I believe nobody provided you with a 0.5 power factor because it was not mentioned in the specs. Nope, and that's correct. And nobody Thank provided you. an oversized alternator either, <laughs> which is what okay. the original generator has. So we're, we've got what we've got and we're looking for the best solution to the problem. So folks, we're willing to, you know, put some skin into this game. Um, a rental generator that's sitting up there would cost, you know, three thousand dollars a week when we normally rent it out, but it's coming to the town with no money. We're willing to put our electricians at no cost of labor. We we're not looking to to hurt anybody or burn anybody or just say it's not my problem. We're here to help you resolve a problem. 
Okay. Yeah. Joel, and, and, go on, Joel. Joel, a couple of questions. Uh, the high lift will pump how many gallons a minute to fill the reservoir? Between 512 and 530 gallons a minute. Okay, 500 gallons. And the low lift, the low pump, how many gallons will that pump? So it pumps the same. It's that it's pulling from the spring box into the tank at the facility. It doesn't have to pump up to the tank. The high lift pumps are pulling up to the tank. So the small one just recharges the system, doesn't push it to the tank. The small one brings it to the chlorine contact tank. So it pulls the fresh water into the chlorine contact tank. So as we are pulling water with the high lift pump out, the low lift is pulling from the spring box and replenishing the water. We pump uh, three feet in the tank. So like- Okay, so my question is, if both high lift pumps were shut off, you couldn't refill the reservoir. Is that good? Am no. I saying that correct? Yeah, we definitely could not. You have to run a low and a high together. And I'm okay. sorry, sir, I didn't answer your question earlier. The, the low, the smaller pump is just a three horsepower pump. Um, to run it, it takes just 2.5 kW to start it. It takes roughly 12 kW. So the generator can run both pumps without, without any issue. Okay, so that's it, the, the high lift. Run them, it just can't start them. Yeah, and that's and that's where the VFD is. Okay, so let's. It's it sounds like we for, might. Ian, it sounds like the, for, the. Ian, Jim, could you um for our viewers describe what a VFD is? It's a VFD stands for variable frequency drive. Um, it's kind of commonly called a soft start. So when you start a, uh, a typical motor, you, you might see on your uh, heat pump or your water pump, you may see a, on the tag an LRA. Now, what that means is lock rotor amps. So there is a uh, very large current that's needed to initially start the motor. Once the motor is started, then it goes down <clears throat> to its normal uh, running load. In this particular case, the tag on the 75 horsepower is, is 56 kW. What the VFD does is it kind of starts it slow and winds it up um, till it gets to full power versus just slamming it with, with power uh, out of the gate. Okay, thank you. Okay, so it seems like we know we know that our new generator can run uh, the high and the low, which is what we need to continue pumping, and that's we're not we don't have a problem with that. There are no other issues with the generator apart from the this inclusion of the VFD. Correct. We we took a load bank to the generator. Um, a load bank is a machine that puts an electrical load on the generator to test it. Uh, and we ran it at full full load, and there were no issues. Okay, so that's good. And so if we just used a single VFD for one of the pumps, one of the high lift pumps, can we, as Jill asked, can we do some programming to say that the backup generator will only use this pump? Is that possible? I believe that's possible because we can always lock out the um, the second pump and send a relay. Uh, I would have to defer to Pioneer Motors if there is some incremental cost on their end. Um, but yes, that, that is possible. But bear in mind, and Jill, maybe perhaps you can comment on this. It is my understanding, as I said earlier, that a human being must go to that plant to start those pumps after there's a power outage to silence the alarms and reset the controls. So if that's accurate, then the plant technician could do that as well. Is that correct, Joe? So here's what goes on, is there's an alternator in that- Wait a minute, Jill, wait a minute. Sorry, sorry. Ian asked, is that what you guys have to do? When the, when the old generator was down there that's now sitting over the town barn, when the power went out, did you have to go down there and 
physically start one pump? If That's the question. Been asked. You are in a pump cycle and the generator does an exercise. It drops the line power and picks up the generator power. It fails all pumps. So yes, you've got to go down there. But inside of that box, there's an alternator that alternates between the two high lift pumps. Okay, so if you've got if you take one of those out of the sequence, you're you're going to be running on one all the time, and the whole point of the two is to be able to flop back and forth. You're saying we'd be running on one if we went back to um, GMP power. I'm I'm saying if you are alternating your pumps and you have one VFD drive on one pump, I am unsure without causing havoc to the panel originally, if that one VFD pump will, one VFD will pick up both pumps, whether it's, whether it's in pump one or pump two. That's the big deal. If that one VFD will run either pump, sure. Yeah, I think, I think there's just a bit of detail if to work the through. The VFD will only run one pump that it's wired to. I don't know if that's ideal. Does it need an alternator? There is an alternator in the okay. cabinet itself, hmm. but I'm saying, will the VFD cancel out the other pump, or will it work with both alternate systems? So, so Sai, are you pump. saying are you saying that it would be better to have two VFDs? That's kind of why we were think, thinking two VFDs because you have two pumps, and do you wire one VFD to two pumps with an alternator in the two of them, or do you just have one VFD go into each pump and they're dedicated so they work every time and I think I need to okay and I and and you're sure that the two high lift pumps will run correctly with VFDs attached to them I am not sure of anything at this point it's kind of ridiculous <laughs> how it's gotten like this um my confidence has been shaken in a situation where you're trying to be sheltered from a storm, and that is kind of uh, not where you want to start, I don't think. So, now, Jill, Jill, you had an electrician visit the uh, pump house and examine the situation over the weekend, and that person uh, did I have confidence. I had a conversation with an electrician over the weekend. I didn't have him visit specifically. Oh, okay. Oh. Um, and he did say a benefit to the VFDs is it does start the motors more softly and that it kind of wears them out less speedily so um i guess i was trying to look for like the pros and cons right to say okay if we want to go ahead with this what are the benefits of getting vfds so i suppose the benefits would be um we would use less <clears throat> it would start the pumps softer than the current soft starts that are there and possibly have less wear and tear on the motors. So Jill, when you say you have alternating pumps, the high lifts, is that like, okay, one pumps for 24 hours and then when the next time we need the high lift, the next one kicks in or is it like three days or okay. I'm just trying to get a feel here. No, so it's every pump cycle. So when the, when the water level drops to 22 feet at the tank, the SCADA system says, hey, it's time to make water. The low lift pump kicks on, it starts to pull water from, excuse me, the high lift kicks on, it starts to pull water from the contact tank. Then the transducer drops in the contact tank and says, oh, hey, it's time to start bringing water from the spring box and the low lift pump kicks on. So high lift pump, low lift pump. Once it gets to 25 feet, it stops and then people use water. The water comes back down to 22 feet and it says, hey, it's time to make water but it switches. I'm going to use the other, the other high lift pump. Now I use one last time. I'm going to use two this time. It's so just how much water's used. Theory, if we had a, a long outage of, of electricity, maybe even more than 24 hours, both pumps could run. Yes. I, I, I'm in favor of two VFDs and I actually don't mind that there's time between the installs because I'd like to see it work before both of them go from being able to work on line power the way that they are to a VFD in the middle, which the VFD isn't just for when it's running off the generator. This VFD is a permanently installed uh, computerized thing that's electrical that's gonna go between 
the power coming in and the pump. It's going to be between the line power and the pump and generator power in the pump. It's there and it's permanent and it's real. And it does and we, not and we, create savings. Yeah, right. And we've talked about that before, right? I mean, that was part of sort of looking at that whole installation and the, the potential of using VFDs to, for, for energy savings as well as longevity for equipment. So yeah. it's something that we have mentioned in the past and now it seems like we're being, we're being moved in this direct direction a little, a little earlier than we thought because of um, the situation that we're in at the moment. And, and Jim, I, I totally agree. I think you, you guys are, are doing an excellent job in helping us. I, I hope it didn't come across that, that fingers were being pointed. I think it was just one of those things where it was, it seems like in terms of hearing things tonight, it's just a very unusual situation. And the generator that we have had previously was maybe an unusual model that was custom built for the system. I don't know, that's what it seems like, but I don't know, we're, we're here now and obviously there's a problem that needs to be solved and, and you're willing to help us with that. Um, I think Jill and Sai hearing everything this evening, I think the two VFDs gives us the most security it it shows us that that both pumps will hopefully fingers crossed work exactly as they do now in terms of the alternation um and our system our our new generator is going to be able to handle them them switching alternatively uh with the vfd so it, it does seem like that's the way to go are, are there any more questions that you need answered uh before oh, the board uh, gives approval for this <laughs> sorry the board was just blinded there uh, are, are there any more, Jill, are there any more questions that you need to have answered before the board might give an approval for the VFDs? Um, I think I just want to point out two more things. Okay. Um, one, I'd like to ask Jim, are you, are you going to see through the installation of both of the VFDs? Yes. Okay. I just want to be sure of that because <clears throat> it is um, quite a bit of a time wait between the first and the second. Um, right. And so and the board knows there's about a six month lead time for one. There is one in stock available uh, right now. So that can be done fairly quickly. Okay. And then I just want the board to understand what you're committing to. The cost of the VFD for one pump is 6,100. The cost for the line reactor is 1737. The cost for the programming by Pioneer is about another $720. So you're talking about a, about $8,557 per pump. So times two is about $17,114. Yes, we won't be doing much maintenance next year. <laughs> this would come out Better of the capital. Where would, Jill, where would it come out of? This would come out of the capital. Okay. Water system capital. So I just kind of want to make sure that you guys understand the depth and breadth of what you're doing. Um, I don't think we have a choice. <laughs> we have, we have, thank you, Jim, a uh, standby generator on wheels and a really very pretty generator that can't run our pumps. So I am, I am wanting a solution quickly and to get them back their other generator um, and want you guys to understand that this is uh, another biggish bite, but like the bite we probably need to take to just move ahead. And we and down the line we could have potentially moved to something like this anyway. Mm -hmm. It's it's you know as I said we're in the situation now, but th this may have happened a year from now potentially too, um, and we're just doing it a little bit earlier or incrementally. <laughs> right, Joel. Um, so the the standby generator on wheels down there now is hooked up. Can't run the high lift pump. Can't start it. it can can't start it. it. it can't. Can run, can the, the one on wheels can we did test it we okay. can okay yes sir okay thank you can you just can you put that in instead of the Kohler that we have <laughs> i was thinking of that too i probably said that to ryan just, just take the wheels off <laughs> like we'll take that one thank you <laughs> yeah one for one hours on wheels mm -hmm. yeah okay all right board what are your thoughts on this I'll have to say I'm a little upset that this wasn't caught right from the get go, but it is what it is now and water over the bridge. So we got to bite the bullet. I mean, we don't have a choice. And what your water analogy is excellent. Well done. Water <laughs> over the tank. <laughs>
All right, do I have a motion then or on this? Well, so the plan is to buy to get the one in the one that they have in stock now, and then it's going to be six months before we have the other one. So, Jill, you'll be able to see how it's going to work. And do we need to pay for them both up front? Can do we, we need pay, to pay for them separately? Yeah. Jim, do we do we pay for the one that's in stock now now and wait to pay for the other one when it arrives? How would that work? Or do we put do we have to pay yes, for the no, other Pioneer, one? No, Pioneer would not charge until they actually deliver the second oh. arrive. Well, that's good. So given the, the issue of, of the alternating pumps, if we have to wait six months, how does that work then if we do lose power? We can use one pump. That's you. <laughs> okay. Yep, All right. I get to make um, sure that the right pump is running when we lose power. Or Cyrus, okay. of course, or Logan, whomever is in charge on that given day. Okay. So that's that's it'll cause a little bit of, of, of extra work. But I think it'll give us that time in between of comfort of getting used to having a VFD. And if anything I've ever seen done at a pump house always seems to have some kind of convoluted punishment involved with it. So at least we've still got one that we know totally runs with line power works perfectly and then hopefully we'll have one with a vfd that runs great with the generator and still with the line power and eventually both with both and to, to get a system where you don't have to manually go into the pump house it can that any anything like that be accomplished with the vfd and because it's a computer and it's programming or is that that is another project completely where it would just switch over by itself no, no, we already have that. That's our SCADA system. We already totally have that. It's okay. just that with one without the VFD and it can't start with ah. the standby power, we just, it would fail. It would go boom. Nope. I see. Okay. And that, that failure doesn't damage the generator, correct? I have no if, idea. If, if it was done repeatedly over time, eventually, yes, it would weaken the windings, but <laughs> once or twice, there are safeties in the generator to shut down when it knows it's being overloaded. But if it was a ongoing thing for years, yes, eventually the windings would get weaker. Okay. All right. Hopefully Jill will get down there. Jill or Cy or Logan will get down there quicker than a year or two to oh, fix God. that. So. <laughs> yeah, I, pretty quick. Or like seven okay. minutes away, so. All right. Well, if you if Jill and Cy are, are confident in this direction, it, it seems like the only choice for us. Um, so I'd entertain a motion. So moved. Sorry. Said, said with enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have a we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion on this matter? And this would be to authorize the purchase of two V. Uh, FDs. Yeah, and, and, and the uh, pertinent. Yeah, and the, the associated hardware that goes along with that. What was, so it's the VFD. What's the second thing, the 1737? What was that, Jill? Line reactor. Line reactor. And the $120 an hour of and then the programming. programming by Pioneer. OK. All righty. Motion second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Say aye, raise your hand. Aye. aye. All those against? Motion carries. Thank you, Jill and Cy. Please keep and, us updated. And Jim, thank you, Jim, for, Jim, for your you. time yeah. tonight, too. Yeah. Hi, it's good to see you in and out of the picture. <laughs> <laughs> he's back. Oh, no, he's at, just an arm. Disembodiedness. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to have to show you guys the office next time so you can keep us <laughs> right <in> here. <laughs> All right. So, it Thank looks you, like everyone. your office is chewing, is eating Cy alive. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, these jobs do that. <laughs> Especially pump <Okay>. stations. <laughs> and thank you, Jim, and your company for assisting with this. Oh, he's gone. Okay. Well, keep us, in, keep us up to date. Hopefully, it's not going to be six months. Maybe parts will come in and it can be built sooner um, and we can have both up and running. But uh, we'll see what happens. All right. Thanks, guys. Take care. Great. Yep. Thank Bye, you. Good night, Good night Jill. All righty. Well, that was fun. <laughs> um, let's move on 819.
What time in here? Uh, item three of regular business. Consider approval of contract for planning cons consultation services for the Planning Commission's bylaw modernization project. Modernization project. <laughs> They include deliberation and executive session to discuss contract negotiations. I should have mentioned that the contract is with the Addison County um, Regional Planning Commission to provide those planning consultation services. Okay. Okay, um, I have to ask, I am confused because I, I thought we had already done the new regs and allowed for increased housing in the village area. I'm not sure that the how, how much the new regs modified building criteria or districts. The purpose of this project, and it's funded through a, a type of planning grant that was specifically offer, offered to municipalities for bylaw modernization, specifically to focus on housing, housing diversity, uh, looking at density, but also looking at other characteristics in the built environment related to parking and uh, streetscape right. issues. Uh, I think the long term goal of folks that depending on what they end up doing uh, is to allow us uh, to encourage communities to qualify for this planning uh, designated thing where where communities that can that qualify for this particular program have uh, it's basically act 250 uh, benefits. Um, Right, it gives us like a feather in our cap having done yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that's the primary goal, though, of doing this. I think the primary goal that the pl the planning commission has in doing this is to genuinely uh, evaluate uh, the current zoning districts, the current zoning regs, and and so there is opportunity for either flexibility or adjustments for certain things. Um, and I don't know what they are, but uh, that's what the planning study is intended for. Yeah, Michelle's right, though. I, the um, new regs, I mean, that's how Bristol Co. Housing or up there where Robert Fuller's building up on North Street, those used to be lots or lots used to be in the village, 12,000, I'm going to say 500 square feet. Now they can be around just over 10,000 square feet. That's what the new regs are now. So, so maybe there's not much work to do and uh, we won't be paying the Regional Planning Commission that much. It's, it's an up to. So if they don't have to do that much work, then and we don't pay them as much. So our match is the nine nine fifty. Is that right? Yeah, it's nine hundred eighty. Yeah, nine eighty. Okay. I mean, I think it's yeah. Work was done on the current current approved regulations, um, but I think there's always always more work needs to be done, uh, and it's it's sort of an ongoing discussion amongst the planning commission about in this particular area and I think just with the changes with COVID in the last two and a half three years obviously housing has become a very important thing to focus on and when you have a town that has certain density rules I think you know we need to look at that um, so I do think this is a good thing I'd entertain a motion if people are interested in supporting this okay so before we do this motion Val I was looking at the letter um, under payment procedures, it says invoices for the work shall be submitted on a monthly basis with the late last invoice submitted prior to July 30, 2019. <laughs> and the but title of the doc, the title of the document that uh, Adam sent over was called boilerplate. So uh, I'm sure <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. So they clearly for, uh, overlooked updating that that line. They'll need to fix that <laughs> or or we've we've already paid them so that's great that's right you know they got that payment date in there and then we're good <laughs> <laughs> all right so let's let's have those changes fixed um but with those it seems like this well, we can support this um i'd entertain a motion so moved so yeah <laughs> thank you i have a motion and a second any further discussion Seeing none, all those in favor, say aye, raise your hands. All right. Aye. Aye. All those against, nay, motion carries. All right, thank you very much. Okay. All right, item four. 
American Rescue Plan Act ARPA funding update. Yes, just a reminder, this is a standing agenda item. Uh, I don't have any documents to share, but at the last meeting on, uh, I believe it was the 18th, uh, the committee had a very robust uh, discussion about next steps and came up with a very detailed list of who's doing what for the next stages. Long story short, uh, the outreach efforts uh, coming up in the in the short term, probably, I think as soon as this weekend, maybe next weekend starting, uh, will be outreach, uh, direct outreach at local events, uh, the, the Bristol Band at the, at the, uh, the, the recycling on, on Saturday, at Shaw's, at other places where people from the committee will actually try to reach out to citizens and hand them a postcard that invites them to uh, share their views about what they think or how they think the town can spend a million dollars to improve the community. And the, the folks will have the opportunity to either hand that, the card back to the person or get a stamp and mail it back. And folks will have, there'll be boxes set up at the library, at the town office, and perhaps another location where folks can drop the cards off also. And there's also going to be a spaghetti dinner on September 8th, uh, free, open to the public, uh, free childcare. And so uh, efforts are gonna go out to advertise that. And there are a lot of other logistics to, to make that to make all of that happen, to pull all of those details together uh, for the dinner. Uh, let's see, I think those are the highlights. Also the creamy stand will be a location for people trying to uh, connect, for committee members to try to connect with citizens. Um, and I think that's it, Diane, Diane is on the line. Perhaps I overlooked something in my effort to be kind of quick. Well, she was at the meeting and she was very engaged and she will be manning a table at the band, the, the Wednesday band. Uh, and uh, let's see, Helen will be doing the Monday music scene. Uh, Betsy and Porter will be doing the recycling on Saturday. Jessica will be um, uh, intercepting people at the creamy stand. Uh, Chris has been extremely active in pulling together the postcard and the logistics of uh, the printing. If they're already printed, I believe the logistics of getting the return postage stamps. He ordered little clipboards for everybody to have available with them at the, at the scene. Uh, and all of those pieces are falling into place. Did we ever, there was a discussion on um, approval to, to spend some of that money. We haven't done that yet. Remember, Val, that you and I thought we'd done it, but the rest of the select board remembered differently? Well, that's we a good get, point, do, because the, the committee... need approval to, to, I mean, obviously money is being spent now to produce the postcards, it's very small amounts of money, but it, but it is coming from those ARPA funds. Correct. How do we, how do we initiate or, or give the okay? Can you do it in your role, or does the select board need to be involved to say, you can start using this? Ordinarily, uh, since the total sum of all of these expenses is probably within or below the threshold for which I have authority to authorize expenses, and ordinarily the select board does not need to be involved in grant funded expenses, uh, on, but perhaps this is a unique situation and because we're having this conversation, uh, it might not be a, a bad idea for the select board to go ahead and, and authorize the committee to be making these expenses through the ARPA funding. Can we make a motion on that? Just this that, is an agenda item. Yes. Okay. Does someone want to do that? Uh, do you want to do an up to amount? I think when we talked about it before, it was going to be like up to a thousand or up to 5,000 for these initial things using the money. I don't know what the rest of the that, board. That was the figure I recall. Also, I believe my um, spending authority prior of that without that, that does not need select board approval it might be 1500. Yeah. What What's the board? What are the board's feelings about approving something or just letting Val do it if it's up to 1500? I guess if it's up to 1500, she can. We're going to spend it no matter what. And, right. <laughs> if it's above 1500, then I mean, is, are we talking 1500 or one shot or 1500 total? 
I mean, because she could approve fifteen hundred in three different invoices. Yeah. Fifteen hundred, fifteen hundred, fifteen hundred. Total. Total. I mean, it might be more than that because you're also doing the mailing and you have return posted. So that that'll add up if you're mailing to everyone in the town. Right. Is that, I can, isn't that, isn't it's that not like mailing about? to everybody in the town. No, we're not. We're not mailing the cards out. It's, oh. it's we're handing them out. Right. We're handing them out and giving the opportunity for them to mail them back. So the number of mailbacks is probably going to be pretty low. Oh, OK. Got it. Yeah, because it's around it's like five or six hundred or thousand to do a mailing. So, OK. That's right. fine. I mean, yeah, if I'm, I'm, I would be happy to have a motion that says up to 5,000, then it covers you. Then you don't need to come back and say, Hey, we need to spend 1600. Um, yeah. But if, but also if it's in pieces, it's up to the board. I mean, it's whatever you guys want to do. Yeah. I have yeah, a I say, leave, I say leave it at 1500. And if it goes over that, then come to the board. I mean, I'd rather know it's, what's going on rather than, Okay. Come back later and all of a sudden we're in the hole. I mean, that's that's a lot of office supplies if they've spent a million bucks. <laughs> I know, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Does that sound okay, Val? Just. Yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to quickly scan the uh, procurement policy for what the uh, town administrator's authority is, but I'm. Um, uh, I need, I need a, a little bit more time. I do think you're right. Five thousand dollars. I think it's I think actually it's... up to five thousand. Oh, perfect. Okay. Fifteen. I didn't hear what Joel said. I said that department heads are up to fifteen hundred. Then you were up to five grand. Okay. All right. That's that me? sounds that sounds very doable. So what's the bottom line? I didn't follow. Uh, five. Yeah, so five, if she's got the author, uh, yeah, authority oh. to five thousand. Then that's that's the limit. If she, yeah. so, whatever whatever the limit that procurement policy calls for, let's correct. Not put it at that. <laughs> whatever that whatever that limit might be. Right, right, right. Okay, super. All right. Any other uh, discussion on that, Val? Uh, I don't think so. Unless Diane wants to add anything. All right. Mm -hmm. Let's move on. Uh, item five, review and was, approve. Was there a, 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 a vote on the motion? Um, well, there was no motion because I think you just have authority to spend up to your, the okay. amount. But I don't think we need to do a motion. Okay. You're, you're free to do what you like to do. Um, item five, review and approval of September 13th, January 24th, or September 13th, 2021, January 24th, 2022, July 14th, 2022 meeting minutes. What do we have this evening? All of them. I make, I make a motion to approve the minute with the well, at least with the changes I made. I'm not sure if anybody else made changes. All second. right. Motion in the second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Raise your hand. Aye. Aye. All those against nay. Motion carries. Minutes Thank are you. approved. Off uh, item six. Authorize accounts payable warrant. And any liquor licenses, Sharon? No liquor licenses. The warrant is seventy thousand dollars, eight hundred and five and twenty nine cents. Nothing out of the ordinary. Okay. Excellent. Uh, item seven: Select board round table. Michelle. Um, I think I'm good. Joel. Uh, just one thing, Eric and I, I had a concerned citizen come over to my house last weekend, I guess it was, um, about a tree that's near her house that's on town property up on Mountain Street. And Eric and was so nice, and we went up the next morning and tried to find her in the house, but she wasn't there or didn't come to the door. And he looked at it, and he's going to have it taken care of. But it brings up a mind that I think... It's a piece of property that's up on Mount Street that's not billable. I don't know why we own it. You know, that little swath? That little swath mm -hmm. up there. And I think we ought to really consider just getting rid of it. Sell it to the neighbors or sell it to the owner in the back. It's, it chunks on a piece of land way up in the back. It's only like 40 feet wide and 100 feet long. And it's, it's not billable. I don't know. We wait long enough. They might change the, well, they the might. rags to allow you to build with something. Is, uh, is it Joel? Is it is it the piece that's opposite the school? 
No, no other side of the further, room. It's up further. It's almost where we stopped the other night and we tried to find 96 um, Mountain oh, View. Okay. Just a little bit north of that. Oh. A piece of land. I'll send you the details and Valerie, I'll call you about it. But I think we ought to just consider looking at it and make a decision whether to get rid of it or not. Joel, do you know why the town does own it? Not sure. Okay. I think it was, it was the lots were laid out when the Raul Devon owned that property. I was a kid. Those houses were never there when I was a kid. <laughs> uh, and he laid the lots out. And I think the abandoned land might be abandoned. I don't know how we, we ended up with it. I think Peeker might have some insight. This came up a couple of years ago. I believe okay. when the adjoining property owner inquired about it, perhaps with the intent to try to acquire it from the town. And there was some reason explained then why the town owns it. I, I don't know the details at the moment, but um, that's my recollection so far. Okay. Should we just have it to, for another select board meeting, just a discussion on that? Yeah, it's 40 feet wide in the back and 150 feet long and 52 feet wide in the back. 40 yeah, maybe, feet in the front. And maybe there was a reason we couldn't get rid of it. Maybe there was <laughs> Could be. I don't know. Or easement on the property. I mean, it looks, like it looks like Peeker's coming in, unless that was someone else chatting with Sharon. But he might know. <laughs> right. No, he's coming down the hall. <laughs> All right. Full room trees, I believe, are done. The, the knowledge will be dropped soon. <laughs> just that's all I have. Okay, just let me go. Yeah. All right. That's why I'm asking. Um, Eric had to cut some trees on it the other day. They were leaning on the country house. I'll fill you in in an executive session. Okay. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Peter. Not to be Not... Made public. So. Okay. Uh, so that's all for you, Jill. Uh, Peter, do you have any uh, select board roundtable discussion? Not that I know of. Okay. Um, I have a couple. Um, I'd like to continue working on the, the Zoom protocols, getting that set up and getting those accounts. We've been approved to do it and we still haven't added them yet. Can I can I do it um, or have Val do it? We The ARPA meeting wasn't recorded, unfortunately, and I just like to get that set up. So the meetings, all the meetings are recorded, um, but I don't know who would, who would buy the extra licenses and set that up. Can I just do that? Can I just add the licenses or does someone else need to do it? The failure for the ARPA meeting not being recorded wasn't license issues. It was, uh, I don't know what the, why it didn't get recorded because uh, so often they automatically come on and say recording in progress. And I don't know why that doesn't or didn't. Uh, when because... was that meeting, Val? Because when I came in and lifted this up, it said the the video wasn't converted. So it said to start converting. And I said, yep. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was probably it. <laughs> oh, so, interesting. May, it may be up there. Huh. Yeah, and I don't know. Okay. Well, we'll Although it was, a, it was a totally remote uh, Zoom, so I don't know why it would be on that computer. Hmm. Okay, well, I so don't know. But... Just on that side note, Ian, so this meeting, if the public wants to watch it on, what is it, 1080, the Northeast Neat Neat. TV, mm -hmm. they can't see this meeting tonight because it wasn't taped, correct? Correct. And that's that's only because Sean is sort of focusing on a lot of the school meetings. Um, once well, once Monday they night, start to... School meetings aren't held on Monday nights. That's why, why we're not getting taped anymore. Um, I don't know. I, I, I can talk to Mary about that. He sh I don't know if he's working fewer hours or if he's focusing on other meetings. The last I heard from her was that because of the amount of school meetings, those are the ones that he's usually doing and not doing this one. But but she's hoping to get back to a regular schedule of having it be live as well. So that is going to come back. She's very, very um, uh, she knows about that and wants wants to get it back to a regular schedule. As, as riveting these are, you know, I've had people ask me, I don't see your meetings on TV anymore. I don't see them. No, it's good. Anymore. I mean, yeah, we, if they can do it live, they will. Um, Tell them, go on computer and you go to the meeting again. Right. And essentially, we record it. I, I send oh, well. Mary the file, and she puts it up there. And I also put it up on YouTube as well. So there are multiple, but there isn't a live version at the moment. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll, I guess I'll just talk to Sharon or talk to Val about that and get that get that sorted out. Um, and to answer your question, Val, it's the ARPA meeting, because you were the original person who set it up, 
you set up the parameters to it, and I don't think auto record was one of them. But for some reason, when you I didn't do anything the... different, but other meetings that I do, it's automatically recorded. Right. So, so. We, need, we just need to sort that out. And trouble is, if you log into the town account, you can't see the ARPA meeting in there. It's it's not like a scheduled meeting, and I don't know why. So I just I want to sort that out too. I have um, it as a recurring meeting. Right, but I but it should be under the town account. Maybe it's under your account. It's not. Okay, well, we'll have to let's sort that out because there are some that are in there and some aren't. So I just want to sort that out and get it get it done. Um, the only other thing I had was uh, I noticed I was been monitoring the flower baskets the last couple of days because our helper's been away. Um, the air conditioner, there's one that's above uh, the laundry mat. Uh, it just drips onto the sidewalk. And past experience I've had on the other side of the street is that it slowly degrades the sidewalk and causes issues. I don't know if we have any particular policy about better capture of, of water from air conditioners. Um, it's right outside the building. It's onto the sidewalk. And I'm just concerned that eventually it will cause issues with water buildup there. Um, or maybe it's a non-issue just because it's been very hot. I don't know if we've ever dealt with that before. It came up when the during the, the uh, Main Street sidewalk replacement project and, and when we were uh, finalizing the, the the completion of the sidewalk we noticed it then and and the and we were alarmed that uh, it would, might be a problem in the future do we know of any way to be able to i know that let's for example melissa has hers above her door and she has it going into a bucket i think the one above the laundromat is just one of the apartments there and it doesn't drip into anything like most it just drips out of the unit can we ask that that water be collected in a better way so that it doesn't impact the sidewalk or cause I think we, we can ask but failing to have a well actually uh no we're, we were updating the work in the right-of-way uh policies to include sidewalks but that wouldn't be a work in the right-of-way kind of thing so yeah I don't know a, a specific tool that we would have to to require somebody to to do it at, at this moment Okay, that was all I had. Um, item eight, town administrator's report. Well, I don't have anything to add to my written report. Um, let's see. So, nope. I I want to I want to uh, draw include uh, reiterate the shout out to Meredith and her team for the great work that they're doing uh, in the rec department and all their programming. He came the last meeting. Yep, I agree. And under other business, I'll you know, draw attention to some other things. Okay, well, let's move on. Uh, other business, correspondence, reports, correspondence received. I uh, want to draw attention to the fact that we received the uh, notice of resignation from uh, Firefighter Wendell, uh, who has resigned from the fire department. Uh, yeah, that was pretty much it. And then at the next at the next select board meeting, there'll be a local concerns uh, meeting regarding the airport road sidewalk scoping study. Excellent. When is the um, tax rate going to be done next month? We usually do it now in August. We already have the school one, but we've got to do the municipal one. I believe the first first week in August. Okay, I didn't see it on your forecast of what's coming up, so good, I wasn't good point. Sure. Yes. Do we have a? Does Anthony and you have a? Have a what? You have a number for us? Not Is yet. We haven't talked about it, but no, I know we yet. usually do it in August, so we can start talking about it. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, we've been sort of discussing moving towards that but we haven't devoted a significant chunk of time to actually devote solely to figuring that out so i guess we just bounce the ball back in your court because <laughs> do you give us a rate we, we can't set something we don't know yet <laughs> right yeah until it tells us what we can set it but it may not be enough to pay the bills right. okay anything else Val? Uh, just that uh, the, the uh, fire chief uh, LaRose asked that the acknowledge the resignation of uh, Brian Wendell from the fire department. And this is little Brian. Yes. Brian C. Yeah. Wendell. Brian C. Wendell. I uh, wish him well on his new ventures going south. And uh, he was a good firefighter. 
and a good EMT for Bristol Rescue too, and you did a lot for the community in his time he was here. And I want to thank you. And he may be back. He may be back. Mm, nice. Uh, and we have executive session this evening, correct? Yes. All right, Michelle. I make a motion that we enter into executive session regarding contract negotiations and labor uh, relations agreement. Do we need personnel too, Val? Yes, uh, and in, invite Eric yeah. and the also person, um, Bruce. Uh, Bruce. And I invite both Eric and Bruce to join us. Okay. Second. All right, we have a motion to second. Any further discussion?